touch something fairly deeply, an item on the screen, they get this live, content-rich preview of that item, be it, let's say, it's a mail or a photograph, uh, without losing their context. So they're not going to a different screen, or, to, or they're not segueing to a different view controller. They're in the same space, but they can preview that item. And from that peak, if they so wish, they can swipe up and get these little immediate preview actions. So again, if it was a, an email application, without losing context of the whole list of emails, they can reply to it or forward it or delete it or do what they wish to do. If they don't preview action, they can pop. And popping is basically the same as a, as a tap. It changes the context. It takes the user to the full screen view of that item. So that's where they change context. And as I said, the action of that pop, which is the peak and a little bit deeper, the pop should be the same as just an ordinary tap on, on a mail or on an item photograph, whatever it may be. Now, I'm not going to cover that this evening, but there's also this concept of quick actions. So from the home screen, you can press the application item, the application's icon rather, and then get this immediate little quick action pop-up menu <coughs> where you have, you have sort of launch commands, if you like. So again, for an email, it could be open your email, it could be open a photograph or start a new document. And finally, for the user, there is pressure sensitivity. So on the 6 and the 6S screen, we know, as developers, we know how deeply the user's pressed, not just for one touch, but for all, I don't know how many, but for multiple touches anyway. So we can do four or five touches and know how, how the pressure of each of those fingers, if they are fingers, they could be pencils in the future. So from a development perspective, What's it, what, what do we need to do? Well, actually, the API into 3D Touch is really, really simple. And there's no at available. You don't have to worry if your uh, device has or hasn't got it uh, with, with complex code. You just need to do a check on the trade collection if the force touch capability is available. And if it is available, we can go ahead and do stuff with peak controllers, with force touch. If it's not, then you should, ideally, with the human interface guidelines, code around it and have an application that, that behaves nicely to people that don't yet have a 6S. Like they might even have a 5, I don't know. So after you know your users uh, has a device that can support 3D Touch, one of the things you may want to do is actually look at the amount of force being pressed. So this is a fairly standard <coughs> overridden Touches McGann handler, which you'd find in a, in a UI view or a UI view controller. The first thing I want to do is make sure, I'm only going to look at one touch here, so I use a guard statement, obviously now we're switched to we're using guard. Make sure that there's a first item and <coughs> optionally buy that to a touch. And then touch has two properties, the force and the maximum possible force. And by dividing one into the other, we can get a normalised value between zero and one. And then we can do with, with, with it what we want. So you might want to, if you're drawing a line, you have a very thin line for zero. <coughs> 0.1, a big fat chunky line for one, or you might want to make the volume go louder for one, or whatever you need to do in your app. Uh, if, the, if you've got to here and your device doesn't, doesn't actually support uh, force touch or 3D touch rather, both these values are zero, and you probably don't want to divide zero by zero, so you might want to work around that to, to provide a, a default amount. To implement peak and pop, Again, that's all pretty simple stuff. So remember, peak is the little preview, and pop is the, the, sort of the when you commit to, to view that item. So for the peak part, or for both of those actually, you need to do this first part. You need to register for preview with delegate. And then you're going to pass in this delegate, and it's the delegate that's responsible for managing the peak and responding to the pop. Uh, and the source view is a chap, or well, the source view is a component. When you do that deep press, is going to send, a, uh, send an event through the, operating, through the operating system and invoke methods on that delegate. So your delegate has to implement this protocol, which is UI view controller previewing delegate. And as long as you've got those in place, as soon as, you, as soon as your user does that deep press on the source view, then we start invoking these methods on the delegate. <coughs> so the first part is the the code that's done for the, or the, the method rather that's invoked for the peak. 
And this is previewing context and it's view controller for location. And that basically you return from that, you return from your method, from your implementation of this method rather, an instance of a view controller you want to pop up and display the, display the preview. Now I have, uh, sorry, let me just jump on. But once the user commits and goes to the pop, this is the second method that's invoked. It's the same method name, but this is a commit view controller method and the implementation rather. And it's this function that you need to handle to, to decide how you're going to hand over control to the full screen view of the item that's been popped. Now I did uh, a tutorial application, and there's a link at the end called Chroma Touch. What Chroma Touch does is allow a user to use touch to set an HSL color, hue, saturation, and lightness color. And when they um, do a peak, this first deep press, it pops up with a nice preview and it shows them the color name as a hex value and little color swatch. So for me to do this in Chroma Touch, I have created my, uh, extended my um, main view controller to implement the view controller previewing delegate. And then the implementation here is that I create uh, an instance of my peak view controller. I'm going to pass it to its uh, uh, initializer, pass it an HSL, which is a struct for hue, saturation, and lightness, which comes from up here somewhere. I pass it over the previewing context delegate, which is actually pointed back to the main application. And by returning that, and with very little other code, I get this nice peak behavior. We can quickly take a look inside peak view controller. This is it, it, it's in it. You can see we pass in the hue, saturation, and lightness, and the delegate sets them as constants. Uh, the delegate is unowned because we want a weak reference. There's the default super, so it compiles. That's me creating the color, a UI color from those three HSL values. And then here's a label that says your color is the hex value of that color. And it sets the swatch background to the color that you've selected. So how does that look? Well, here's peaking in action, fantastic. So the user's changed some values on the slider. They've pressed in deeply, and here we go. Pops up, and just for that code, no other code, with this nice animation, the peak preview. Uh, the, you can see the label there that we populated in the color swatch. Easy. So the next step is these previewing actions. So this is the swipe up where you might get respond to email, delete email. All we need to do is having our, have our preview delegate just implement this method, preview actions, and again, there's nothing else we need to do to get this, this UI built apart from do that. So to get a little array of actions, my Chroma Touch application, uh, when the user swipes up to get those preview actions, they're presented with red, blue, red green, and blue presets. So, I have that as an array. In my preview actions, I want to return an array of UI preview action items. So with a bit of map, I can get those three values, um, take the raw value to do a title, uh, that's the style there, supply a handler, which will be invoked when the user presses on that preview action, and basically it's going to invoke this update color method using, um, using the, the title, red, green, or blue. In that update color, all I need to do is create a create the color preset enumeration from that title, and then here we go. I just set a hue based on red, green, or blue, and I can set the delegate HSL, which is the main application, to the correct color. And how does that look? Well, here we go. Uh, peak, and then swiping up, and I've chosen red. Little peak, swipe up, green, and another little peak, swipe up, and blue. Easy. And the final part of this uh, peak and pop for Chroma Touch is when the user does a depress and they get presented with a full screen preview of their color. So here I'm going to implement preview context commit view controller, and that does very little. I mean, all it has to do here is turn off the user interaction and hide the, the, the stack view that has those three sliders for hue, saturation, saturation, and lightness. And with that, we can go peak and pop, and then I've got some code that listens out for a touch on there and re, re displays these chaps here. So with half a dozen lines of code, we've got peak, preview actions, and popping.
So next up is, we mentioned it before, I mentioned it before, is pressure sensitivity. So we know that a touch gesture, I mean, uh, touches began or touches moved, have obviously X and Y coordinates on the screen. But now with the pressure, we basically have a, a Z coordinate, so we can figure out how deep that press is using that force and maximum possible force. So in um, my Chroma touch application, I, I pick up in my touches moved, I'm going to basically say, what's the normalised X position by dividing the X by the frame dot width, set that to the Q. What's the normalised Y position by dividing the, the Y location into the height. And here's the new thing, what's the normalised Z position by dividing the force into maximum possible force, and set that to the lightness. So now you can change the hue with a left and right, the saturation by moving up and down, and the lightness of the colour by moving in and out. So here is Chroma Touch in its full glory, with someone's finger busily moving up, down, left, right, and in and out. And the in and out is changing the brightness, the up and down saturation, and the left and right, the hue. Now you may not want to do um, uh, touches, movement, touches, but if you're used to using uh, UI gesture recognizer, which you probably use for long presses or tapes or double taps, you can actually extend UI gesture recognizer, and I've done this and it's on, on my blog in my GitHub account. You can extend UI gesture recognizer to be a deep press gesture recognizer. The one downfall is we don't have access, there's no public API to the Taptic engine, so you don't get that nice little feedback, little taptic feedback. But it does mean you can, you can um, attach this with just a recognizer to anything, like a button or an image or any other sort of UID, a UI control. Um, the guts of it, we won't go into the full details here, but in essence, uh, a UI gesture recognizer has its own touch just moved and is aware of the view that it's attached to. So you can see in here, I've got a little flag which is called depressed. I make sure I've got a view, make sure I've got a first touch, and also make sure that we, in essence, we have our force touch enabled. We're making sure both those values are not zero if they are return out. And then there's two, basically two states in here. One is if, if we're not yet depressed and we're over the threshold of pressure, then we, by setting this just recognize the state to began, um, starts the sort of process back up in the application that the, the, the gestures began, we set deep press to true. And if we're in deep press mode, and we've jumped back, we've sort of lost the, the force, got to below the threshold, the gesture, uh, gesture's ended and deep press is false. So that can be attached to, to anything, the same way that a long press would be. The final thing that's not quite 3D touch, but is quite important, is touch coalescing. Now that touch is moved, happens in sync with the, um, the refresh rate of the monitor, which is 60 hertz. If you are doing touch sampling on an iPhone 6S, that actually does, has a sample rate of a touch of 120 hertz. And if in the next month, if you're using an iPad Pro, that will sample at 240 hertz. So you already can see that touch is moved working with 60 hertz is going to miss out, or could potentially miss out, on at least half of the touches on the 6S and a quarter um, on the iPad Pro. And the way around that is rather than just reacting to the touch, is the event has a method on it called coalesced touches per touch, and that returns to you all those little intermediate touches. So if someone's done that, you may only get one or two touches moved invocations, but actually if you interrogate the coalesced touches per touch, you can get all those little intermediate touches. So you might get, well, I think you might get three of these, you might get nine or ten of those intermediate touches. That coalesced touches includes the main touch. You don't need to make a special case for the main touch and the coalesced touches. And you can just loop over there, and rather than whatever you've done up here for the main touch, you can do down here for those coalesced touches. And that looks a little bit like this. Here's a little demo app. The blue circles are drawn with every touch is moved, but the little yellow ones are drawn with all the coalesced touches. And you can see in a few places, there's, you know, there's obviously a lot more yellow, well, double the number of yellow to the number of blue. There's also something else called predicted touches, which I haven't mentioned here, but those little tadpoles 
uh, where IOS thinks that you're just going to touch next and that they didn't actually do it, I didn't actually do it. But the, I think the Yano shows a good indication that you can get a smoother um, and a nicer sort of touch response by looking at those coalesce touches. Finally, a couple of demo apps. First one is a PH Image Manager photo browser. Here you can see a peak, just pops up a preview, and then there's a, a preview action which is to toggle the favoriteness of an item. So you can see there, let's go to the photo with a pop, is changing a favorite, remove favorite, and then the UI updates. Here's another little demo, which uh, I call Force Sketch. Here, the, both the line thickness and the hue, the color of the line, are controlled by that touch. So you can see the, the color sort of cycling through the different hues, getting fatter and thicker, fatter and thinner. Here's a little, these are all again on my, um, on my GitHub, so you can poke around and play with them. Here's some meta balls, which are attracted to the touch, but the, so the touch is a radial gravity source, but the stronger the touch, or the more force of the touch, the higher the gravity. Here's making use of peak previews. So by touching on the screen, this is a really high resolution image. It pops up a one-to-one -one resolution preview at where the user's touched. Oh, I catch it. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, a little experiment I did doing 3D touch retouching, where you, you, the users apply a core image filter, and the strength of that filter applied locally is related, obviously, to the, to the strength of touch. So by going sharp and then just doing a light touch, it doesn't apply that very much, but by doing increased saturation and really pressing down, you get some really increased saturation. All of my, and there's plenty of them, all of my 3D touch blog posts are at that quick, quickish Google uh, shortcut thing. Alternatively, just have a little look at the blog. They're all the recent ones, and there's, there's shed loads of them. But uh, yeah, enjoy. Thank you very much. <laughs> Any 3D touch related questions? Um, the, you're normalizing the reported yeah. touch value. Um, what is it actually? What is, what is the maximum, maximum actually? Maximum success is two thirds, point six 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 seven. And I don't, there is a reason, or there are rumors of reasons, but yeah, on the success, it's, it's point six 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 seven. So the, the idea is that that might, so a different device might have a different maximum touch. Yeah, I think so. Or maybe a different um, pointing device. So maybe on the iPad Pro, a finger touch may be different to a pencil touch. Maybe, but, but I don't know. We don't know. Yeah. Which is why I've always just divided one by the other. Okay. Hey. Do you, uh, do you think of it when you would do that vision? So I mean, like, when, when you would need the more brand? No, I mean, I think, I would always want to know how deep is a touch compared to the maximum possible touch. And I think that's a fairly so that, that number doesn't change depending on the type of application or, yeah. the, or any other sort of environmental thing. So I, I, I just have by default now divide one by the other. So I, I I'm just wondering why the API doesn't do that normalization for I don't know. I'm sure there's a reason, but I, I don't know what it is, I'm afraid. I mean, maybe what about the non linear? Like all the rest of it? Yeah. But then I just, yeah. Yeah, could do it. Is there anything you can do on the feedback side? I know you said no. I mean, you can. There's, um, I think, in core audio, you can fire off the default buzzer. And there was one chap who has found a private API to, to do the tactic engine. But a, it could damage your device, and b, I suspect you wouldn't get it through the app store. But maybe they might open it up. So there's, yeah, there's dirty hacks. And there's a big, horrible, sort of alert vibration. Cool. Thank you. Cheers, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you.